sorry, I got tangential there. And what, I'm sorry, what was this? The disputes between ambassadors? Yes. Cases involving ambassadors. Exactly. I've heard ambassadors' parking tickets can be heard by the U.S. Supreme Court. <laughs> <laughs> by the way, they, they're heard by U.S. Supreme Court magistrates, not the, not the, not the real nine. The real nine are to <laughs> be there for the ambassador's parking ticket. Yeah. Okay, so going back then to Florida Supreme Court jurisdiction. There are certain cases that the Florida Supreme Court has to hear, that they're compelled to hear. They are what I call death cases. And I'm going to explain to you what I mean by death. The first is obvious. Death penalty cases. Cases that involve the state's pursuit of a death penalty, of the death penalty against a convicted criminal must be heard by the Florida Supreme Court before the final order of execution literally is enacted. Okay. Why do you think that is? Again, kind of looking big picture, looking almost philosophically, why do you think? Taking somebody's life. Taking somebody's life. What is the greatest power that the government could have? Your freedom. Taking somebody's life. Okay. Yeah. Your freedom? Yes. And certainly the loss of your life is the greatest loss of freedom, right? That could potentially exist. That is why there is such a significant level of of um, review of death penalty cases. It is so important that before the death penalty is enacted that, that a, um, a convicted criminal has had every opportunity to um, uh, address any potential error. Yes? Do you know what state holds the most death penalties? I, my guess is Texas. I think Rick Perry had like 430. Yeah, my guess is Texas. I think Georgia would probably be a close second and we are probably Third. That's just my. Now there was a stay on executions in Florida enacted probably maybe a year ago now because of some issues about um, the jury versus the judge's involvement in in the enactment of the death penalty and what role the jury was playing versus the judge. Um, so we've had a stay, but I do think that that's been addressed. Uh, actually, you know what? I'm not sure. I honestly don't follow it closely enough, but. Um, but we're up there, you know. Florida's certainly up there when it comes to um, the number of uh, death penalty cases and um, and executions on an annual basis. Um, yes, it is the greatest power that the government can have. Okay, so um, so the court does not take those cases lightly. That is why it is not uncommon for an individual who receives a death penalty conviction to be on death row for 10 or 12 years. Okay, it can take that long to go up to the Florida Supreme Court, often multiple times, on multiple potential appellate issues. That's why that legal process just uh, tends to take quite a long time. Okay, so death of an individual is one. The other type of cases that the Florida Supreme Court must hear are what I call death of a statute cases. The death of a statute goes back to this concept of checks and balances. What is, it, what is the judiciary's role if the legislature enacts a statute which is unconstitutional, which violates constitutional principles, either Florida constitutional or U.S. constitutional principles? What's the judiciary's role in that? Power of judicial review. Right? To find that statute is unconstitutional. Now they can't do it until a case comes to them with it, right? It is not a situation where a circuit judge is sitting in her living room one day and she reads, you know, Florida Legislative Weekly and sees that there's a statute that was just enacted by the Florida legislature and she's like, hmm, it doesn't look right. I don't know if that's constitutional. I might need to do something about it. Was okay. that the case where you Doesn't work that way. Yeah, I'm sorry. Was that the case where you said they were like waiting at the airport that one time the lawyers were? That was actually in federal immigration. Oh. Yes. By the same token, though, it's kind of the same concept. So, yes, yeah, so, okay, so what she's talking about is when uh, President Trump's immigration 
executive order was enacted, was issued, the only way that 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 order, the enforcement of that order could be challenged is if somebody was adversely affected by it. If somebody was denied entry to the United States when it was believed that they would have had a constitutional right to enter. So what, were, what was happening is there were uh, groups of lawyers from, I don't know if it's Southern, po Southern Poverty Law or probably just ACLU, probably ACLU lawyers who were waiting outside of immigration, looking for individuals who were coming from one of the affected countries. You know, um, and, and I'm a lawyer, do you need help? Hoping that they could find somebody who had been affected by that immigration ban, because they had to find somebody who had been affected by that ban to be able to then bring a case and then file a case in the district court. That's why you saw one of the first cases came out of Seattle group of attorneys in Seattle, and they were doing this all over, the group of attorneys in the Seattle airport found an individual um, who had been, uh, they believe their constitutional rights had been violated by the enforcement of the ban by the immigration officials in the Seattle airport, and they were able to bring that case to the district court in Washington, state of Washington, in Seattle, and then ultimately um, up to the U.S. Supreme Court the, um, by a temporary restraining order. But yeah, so that's that, that's that process that you have to have standing, right? Somebody actually has, that goes to this concept of jurisdiction, that you must have standing. Again, my example, a judge sitting in her living room cannot say, I think that's unconstitutional, I'm going to issue an order. No, they have to wait for a case to come. Those lawyers were kind of just basically trying to advance the process a little bit. You know, let me find somebody who's been affected. That's what the ACLU does because they're obviously advocating, um, you know, for, for some of those issues. So. Um, okay. A case is brought, let's just say, in Baker County to a judge, and a judge in Baker County says, yeah, that, con that statute, as applied to this particular case, is unconstitutional. Issues an order declaring that that statute, the, the application and enforcement of that statute is unconstitutional, and the particular case has been brought in front of her. Is that statute now deemed unconstitutional statewide? No. No, it's not. In order for that, and, and I'll tell you what, this statute could be as blatantly constitutional as blatantly constitutional is. And that Baker County judge was just the first one, you know, to have gotten a case that, that you know, could be heard and, um, Required, or you know, I should say, I should say required, but uh, you know, by an application of law to the facts, um, the correct ruling was a declaration that was unconstitutional. What's it going to take for that statute to be deemed unconstitutional in all 67 counties of Florida? It needs to be heard by the Florida Supreme Court. Okay, so that's why if that case is appealed on up, the Florida Supreme Court is going to have to hear it. And it's not going to be deemed unconstitutional until such time as the Florida Supreme Court weighs in on it on a statewide basis. The reason for that is this. From a fundamental, from a kind of a concept of fundamental fairness, when we're talking about judicial philosophy, not judicial philosophy, but checks and balances, is it right for one judge in one county to be able to declare a statute to basically upend the intent of the Florida legislature. Think it might be? I don't know. Sometimes I get yeses. <laughs> okay. That the act of that one judge is indeed contrary to the declared intent of the Florida legislature, representatives from all 67 counties. Okay, so that's why the Florida Supreme Court is going to need to weigh in before it's deemed unconstitutional statewide. Isn't that two thirds uh, passed? Yeah. yeah. Yes. So, before it can upend the intent of two thirds of the Florida legislature. Okay. Yes. All right. Any questions about what the Florida Supreme Court has to hear? Okay. Um, let's move on to administrative law just very briefly. Um, 
on those topics, you know, just, I mean, a couple again, sticky points. Enabling statutes, that's what gives birth to an agency. Keep this in mind. There is no mention of any agency anywhere in the U.S. Constitution. Okay. Our founding fathers were never envisioning <laughs> NASA, Securities and Exchange Commission. Somebody said SEC once, and I made some stupid comment thinking that they were talking about the Southeastern Conference. They were like, no, Kirsten, it's the Securities and Exchange Commission. Yeah, SEC, FCC, NASA, IRS, the list goes on and on of agencies. Those agencies only exist because a statute has been created by Congress where Congress has taken their lawmaking power and giving it to this agency. Okay. Sort of think of it as a parent giving a child responsibility. You only have this responsibility because I gave it to you. They have final authority, they have final responsibility, but they've given that responsibility to the agency to do the work of drafting, creating, vetting regulations on various different issues. What gets interesting with agencies, though, is that agencies can have, again, this quasi-legislative role, like we just talked about, the drafting, the creating of different regulations and rules on an unimaginable number of different topics. <laughs> but agencies can also have quasi-judicial type responsibilities as well, as well as enforcement power. So in many respects, agencies kind of encapsulate these three different branches of government. Again, some legal scholars have called that into question. Is it fair, is it right for something like the IRS? IRS is an example of an agency that, in my view, I love it when I put in this stuff on tape, hope I don't get audited one day, <laughs> has executive, quasi-executive, quasi-judicial, quasi-legislative power. Let me give you an example of what I mean by that. The IRS writes their own regulations, right? Okay. Now they have to, again, be approved by Congress but they write their own rules and regulations that govern the enforcement of tax law. Now, tax laws are written by Congress. Heavens knows we're going through that right now, right, with tax reform. But the regulations that pertain to some of those specific details of how, uh, you know, the boatload of exceptions and documentation required and schedules and all that, you know, that's, that's the work of the IRS. Okay, so they have that quasi-legislative role. They have an enforcement role, which is something that's generally reserved right for the executive branch, right? The police power, the enforcement role of the executive branch. Well, the IRS has that. How? What happens if you don't pay your taxes? So, I love it when students say this, and I'm not saying this to pick on you. But you actually don't go to jail for not paying your taxes. You know why you go to jail? because you've lied about it. Okay, that's the distinction. Somebody who is unable to pay their taxes due because they are simply financially unable to pay the tax due will not be imprisoned. We do not have a debtor's prison in the United States. What people do go to jail for is tax fraud. Tax fraud is lying on your tax returns, lying about an income, lying about your budget income, lying about a deduction, lying about documentation, all those kinds of things. That will indeed send you to jail. But if you're purely in a situation of saying this is the tax owed, I'm being 100% honest, you are being 100% honest, I simply do not have the money to pay you, IRS, you'll have a tax lien on your back for the rest of your life, and then some, but you won't go to jail. Make sense? There's sometimes a fine line between, though, owing the IRS money and whether or not you lied about the money that you owe. So that's, that can be a whole different thing. Okay. Um, that's an example of their enforcement power. They can also have a judicial-type role, a quasi-judicial role. 
there is a, I mean, there is a tax court. Of course, that, that is a separate, uh, that is a separate part of our judicial system. But um, IRS agents can, you know, make a determination in the audit process, reviewing your documents and make a determination. Um, it's kind of a little bit of the fox guarding the hen house, a little bit. But that's the power that that agency has. Okay. Not all agencies have quasi-executive, quasi-judicial, quasi-legislative power. I use the IRS, the Social Security Administration is another one that does, I think, have all three of those powers. But many just have just have that quasi-legislative power, just have um, quasi-legislative maybe an enforcement power. So again, it all depends on what's in that enabling statute. Any questions about administrative law before we move on to something else? Are we good? Okay. Is that clock a little slow? I feel like it's a touch later. Okay. I think I'm still off on daylight savings. All right. Um, partnerships and corporations. I mean, I felt like we spent a lot of time on that in the review. Just like with anything else, I'm going to encourage you to go back and listen to that review. Um, but, um, it, you know, again, I think I'd encourage you to make sure you know the difference between how S corps and C corps are taxed. Um, that was kind of a sticky point on the exam, some of those distinctions. Again, a C Corp has pass, excuse me, a C Corp has double taxation. That means that both the entity, the corporate entity itself is taxed, and distributions, proceeds, dividends, what have you, that the shareholders receive are also taxed at their own individual rate. In other words, with the C Corporation, the IRS essentially gets two bites of the apple one at the entity level, and then again, taxing any proceeds that the shareholders might have received. As corporations avoid that, as corporations have the same pass-through taxation that partnerships have, that LLCs have, that basically all the other entities for the most part have other than C-Corps, okay? Any questions about that? Again, I just encourage you to, just to listen to that review again on those topics. Um, did we talk about piercing the corporate veil during our review? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, did I talk about the fact that Florida courts generally don't pierce, but my concern for about commingling assets? I'll just mention it very briefly. Florida courts are very protective of our corporate veil, if you will. Very protective of um, not finding shareholders personally liable. Um, and ensuring that protection, that corporate protection. And again, when I'm using that term, that same veil of protection that protects shareholders from personal liability also extends to LLCs when we're talking about members. Okay. Remember, shareholders are protected from individual personal liability um, because of a corporation's negligent acts. Members of an LLC, by the same token, are also protected um, from the negligent acts of the LLC. So, uh, you know, in that sense, those entities are the same. Um, however, in other states, not all of you may spend the rest of your lives in Florida, so that's why I bring this up. Other states are sometimes are a little bit more permissive with it in the sense that uh, they may be willing to pierce the corporate veil if there is a clear situation of a lack of adequate capitalization. It's clear that the corporation has not adequately capitalized in order to protect itself from negligence or the liability that they would owe by their own negligence to others um, or improper commingling of funds. Okay, if and, and improper commingling of funds can happen really, really easily in small businesses. You know, small family-owned businesses, there can be, it can start to be a really gray area about what's a business asset versus what's a personal asset. What's being used for business purposes, what's being used for personal purposes. Um, can be very, can, can get sticky quickly with family businesses. So just keep in mind, I personally think appropriate capitalization and taking all appropriate actions to make sure you're not commingling funds is simply good business practice. In my opinion, that's a basic fiduciary duty. It would apply to any any Florida business. My opinion on that. 
Um, but it can, in other states, potentially be grounds for Pearson 